looks like, like in like the actual real diagram, sort of, uh, in the literature. And you'll see that there are numerous other clock proteins that feed into this. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but just a few of the ones you're probably familiar with. Uh, I threw timeless on the list because no one actually knows what it does, but it's got a great name, right? So I had to include it. Um, sirtuins, we all know sirtuins. It turns out that sirtuin one and six are integral to all of this, and we're going to get to that in a second, but we know that sirtuins drop with age, and I'm sure all of you are on sirtuin activators. AMP kinase and mTOR, those affect this, right? And that has to do with how much energy you have to feed into the system to sleep or not to sleep. NAD is very important, as we know, and then there's a variety of other things, the cofactors, but we don't need to go into much detail. Oops, did I just do this? Okay. So two and one and six, what are they for those people that don't know? We have seven mammalian sirtuins. One, six, and seven live in your nucleus. Two flits around the cell. We don't really know what it does. Three, four, and five live in the mitochondria. And if you want energy, you have to upregulate uh, number three. But one and six are key uh, for all of this. They're deacetylases, right? Because that's what they are. They're epigenetic modifiers. And they turn other enzymes on and off usually on, sometimes off. And of course, because they're sirtuins, they require NAD as a cofactor. And we all know that over the course of time, we are NAD deficient. What does one do? This is just where it gets like this ridiculously complex, like in and out sort of thing. So it's a deacetylator. So it deacetylates BMLA1, which is interesting, right? Because uh, clock acetylates it. So now we've got a war going between clock and sirtuin one. That sort of increases oscillation. It also changes the rhythms with all the PERVs and the cryptos. And I didn't talk about it, but there's two types of PERVs and two types of cryptos. It doesn't really matter. But what it does is it just makes the oscillations huge. The bigger the oscillations, the better you sleep, right? And we know that it's NAD uh, dependent. I said that. We also know we have a sirtuin deficiency over time. Six. We used to think that six didn't do a whole lot of anything, but six is huge in your DNA repair mechanism system. And this is how I got into all of this in the first place. Uh, so what does it do? It brings BMLA1 to the E box, right? So that's crucial. If you don't have that, the whole system sort of falls apart. And it also stabilizes the negative part, per two, right? That's the negative feedback loop. It stabilizes that. Uh, and just remember that these things do other things. It also controls all of your fatty acid and cholesterol metabolism. Sorry. All right, NAD. Uh, we know that NAD does innumerable things around the body, right? Uh, in my world, it does four things. Uh, it's for the electron transport chain, helps with DNA repair mechanisms, it's a sirtuin cofactor, and it's a tran uh, it communicates energy levels between your nucleus and your mitochondria. In this aspect, it's, it helps as a cofactor of your sirtuins. But this is so inbred, it's fantastic, because NAD is created in an oscillatory fashion. When you activate your E-box, you're making the enzyme, i.e. NAMF, right, that makes NAD for your salvage pathway. So NAD is created in a circadian fashion. What's also fabulous is that the NAD then controls how this whole thing works. So it's this fantastic another layer of feedback systems, right? Um, the half-life of NAD is also very short. And we don't think about this, right? So when you go get your NAD treatment, people go for one month, whatever, and you get this huge IV uh, infusion and then nothing. Well, we can see that that's pointless because anything in the circadian feedback loop has to have a short half-life because it has to oscillate, right? So NAD has a short half-life, therefore taking a huge dose once a month does not help you, at least in this regard. You're gonna metabolize it and then poof, it's gone. So you're better off with small doses at a re on a regular level if you're trying to like copy a standard metabolic pathway. Thank you. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. The other interesting thing is every study on circadian rhythms is done in rodents. And rodents are nocturnal. Is anyone right? Yeah. So it's incredibly hard to find human evidence because it says mammalian evidence everywhere. And you go, is that human? Is it rat? Mm -hmm. So some of the things you have to really sort of tease out because it's backwards sometimes. So we think that NAD levels are highest in the morning in humans only because it's backwards from rats where it's not, right? So if you're going to take your NAD every day, take it in the morning, right? Because that's when your body needs it. Okay. Sleeping Beauty, for those of you who have forgotten, right? 
It's not Cinderella, this is Sleeping Beauty. And this is to remind me that circadian proteins work in two different ways. Either A, they work directly. And we're gonna see, I'm give you one example of how a protein involved in the system does something directly, or it does something really important indirectly by activating the E box. So example one is BMOL. We said that this was the main orchestrator for sleep, right? But that's just one of the things it does. It controls your mitochondria. It controls all of your metabolism, your glucose, your lipids, your amino acids. BMOL controls this. DNA damage repair systems. Again, this is how I got into this in the first place. Uh, controls bone growth. This is why if you're not sleeping, you're gonna fractures. And it blocks fat production. So again, if you don't have BMOL and you're not sleeping, you're gonna get fat. Bad things, right? So the point being is that sleeping is one thing, but all of the other things are just so unbelievably important. And we know that BMOL1 declines with age. So the second category here is telomeres. Who here has heard of a telomere? 17,000 hands, right? So it turns out that all of the enzymes involved in telomere biology are oscillatory, right? They're all listed here. Telomerase, it's oscillatory. It's on the circadian cycle, as is TERT, as is Terra, right? So if you're not sleeping, you're not making uh, all of these proteins, you're not making your, your, the stuff that's keeping your telomeres healthy either. And we know, at least in rodent models, that if you have a clock deficiency, your, your telomeres are getting shorter than they should be, right? Okay, so what really happens as you're getting older? So from a cell biology perspective, uh, when we track this stuff, the robustness of the cycle declines, right? Big oscillatory wave that I talked about, it's not so great. The synchronization of the tissues falls apart, right? It's supposed to come from your brain to go out to the rest of your body, and that falls apart. So your pancreas is oscillating in one spot and your kidney is doing it in another and it sort of screws everything up. Uh, as well, as I said, the amplitude changes and it shifts, right? That's, a, that's what our little waves look like. But what do we see, right? Everyone says you're getting older, you don't sleep as well, yeah. right? What do we see? People have more morningfulness, right? It used to be like a teenager sleeps until noon. When you're older, you don't. You get up at the crack of dawn. That's just, right? That is the failure of all of these, these chemicals. We wake up more, we can't go to sleep as well. When we do wake up, it's, you know, we, the world keeps us awake and everything falls apart. And as it turns out that after the age of 40, when true age starts, you lose 30 minutes of sleep every decade, which seems like a very small thing, but as we know, it's because we're all in that age bracket, it sort of creeps up on you. And all of a sudden you're not sleeping the 12 hours that a teenager slept. You're like, oh, eh, five is good enough. But you know what? Not. So, I went back and I made a list of all of the things that decline with age. And this is like, these are like the high points. BMOL1 goes down, clock goes down. We know your sirtuins go down, right? NAD goes down, AMP kinase goes down, and ROR alpha goes down. Unfortunately, this is just true. But on the other side of the screen are the hacks. These are the things that increase these things. And I know for a fact that everyone in this crowd is very interested in hacking this. And you're probably on a variety of these things already, but I'm going to point out a few that you probably haven't heard of. Uh, I'm sure everyone here is on spermidine, right? Selenium is really interesting, and we're going to talk about that in a bit, but most people are selenium deficient. Um, in terms of sirtuins, I'm sure everyone's on a sirtuin 1 uh, activator, usually was veritrol, pterostilbin. Who here is on the sirtuin 6 activator? So the option, yeah, yeah, you don't count in the back. <coughs> So fucodan and cyanidin are the big uh, important ones. Fucodan is the easiest to get. It comes from a seaweed from Japan. Very important. Uh, I'm sure everyone here is on an NAD precursor or something. I just poo-poo the infusions, but you, need, you do need to uh, NAD somehow. AMP kinase metformin is the easy one, but a million things do it. ROR alpha is the one that I bet no one here is worried about augmenting yet, right? And this is the key one. This is just so interesting. Turns out when you start taking nobilitin, because it's my favorite of the group because I've tried them all, you just sleep significantly better. Where does nobilitin come from? It is horribly underappreciated. If you look at my rating system, you'll see a ton of twos. And the way my rating system works, for people that don't know or don't remember, is I do it by evidence. So if something does something uh, in a culture or a test tube, it does a one. 
If it does something in a mammal other than humans, it gets a two, and if there's human evidence, it gets a three in each of the seven tenets of aging. So you see that there's a ton of evidence in mammals in almost every aspect of this, but no one's, no one's looking at this in humans yet, so the numbers are probably lower than they should be. I think over the course of time, everyone's gonna be on nubilitin. That's my guess. So what does it do? It's an ROR agonist. And this was in the plus sign on our group. So this will increase the oscillations to make you sleep better. I also like things that have several components to them or do several things. So it's an, it's an NRF2 activator. That turns on all of your endogenous free radical scavenging capacities, your glutathione, your catalase, your superoxide dismutases, et cetera. It's an anti-inflammatory and it's an antihistamine. So like, what could get better than that? And it comes from orange peel, so people like stuff that's natural, there it is. I wouldn't necessarily recommend eating the orange peel. It's kind of crunchy, um, but it does come in tablets. This is kind of a cool one as well. And again, I'm just trying to show you things that maybe you haven't heard of because you guys are rather educated. Neuroscogenin, this is fantastic. People take it for hemorrhoids and varicose veins, right? Pretty bizarrely random. It also helps you grow muscle, right? Which is useful. But again, it's an ROR alpha agonist. So it's the same mechanism. It's going to help you sleep better. It's not going to put you to sleep, but it will increase the oscillation so that you sleep deeper and better and your little aura ring will be happy. Uh, and then the last one I've shown in here, most people are on spermidine, probably. If you haven't, maybe you should be. It's in the polyamine family. Um, I love the names of this. this, is why I always include them. Who couldn't turn down something called putrescin, right? It's fantastic, right? It's putrid, it's putrescin. Uh, spermidine and spermine, they're just different lengths of the same molecule. Uh, and they do many things. And they're, like, I tried to track down all of the feedback loops in your clock, and it's just it's like a tangle of spaghetti. Uh, essentially, though, polyamines are also clock proteins, so they oscillate, and then they help the oscillation. So they stimulate BMLA1, which is positive, but they also stimulate reverb, which is negative. So again, we're increasing the oscillatory rate. Uh, they also help the different molecules interact, especially the PUR and the crypto. Those are the two that were stuck together. Like the crypto is the square and the, per and the period is the circle. It helps them come together more readily. Uh, we know that as you get older, you have less uh, polyamines in your body. And we know that if you give it to adult mice, they just like sleep heavily after. Uh, so it's a good thing. Selenium, I, I mentioned this briefly. Most people are selenium deficient. Too little selenium will kill you too much. Way too much selenium is also also bad for you. But you, there's a happy medium. So if you haven't had your selenium levels measured, I recommend that you do so. Depending on where you live in the world and what your diet is will sort of dictate your selenium levels. But having high to medium levels of selenium increases DNA repair rates and it will help you sleep. And then lastly, I couldn't not put melatonin on here. It doesn't actually fit into any of this because it works centrally uh, and in the SCN. And it turns out that you have two melatonin receptors. Uh, there's one and two. As you age, unfortunately, the receptors uh, get downregulated and your melatonin also gets downregulated. So giving melatonin back will help your central clock, but it doesn't do anything for the periphery. But again, this will help you go to sleep and the other things will help you stay asleep. So when you are thinking about sleep, uh, I want you to think of all of these things. And when you put a program together, know that the system is extremely complex and interdependent. So bumping one up may turn off the other and vice versa, right? So what you want to do is create a program where it's a little of everything. You want something to help you sleep, something to increase your BMLA1, something to help your clock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to overdo any one because it's just going to throw the whole thing system cantilever. Um, so as you create your own longevity program, and I know you guys are all on your own longevity stack, throw some things in there that will help with sleep so that you're not sort of falling prey to all the negative, horrible things I talked about. Uh, and that is it. <laughs>